strikes by my window Hits my chest right in the morning Like a warning Could have slept here for days I felt your heart beat, felt your mouth Hello, hopefully um, you can all see me. Welcome to this special edition of the Dad Hassle podcast. Um, this is the sales floor for event sales professionals. And we have some fantastic guests coming up. Can someone just give me a nod that they can actually see me on the broadcast? That will be um, appreciated. Um, so I want to thank my sponsors. So my patrons, Hive Group, PLC, Tarsus Group, Rizni, Smart Digital, um, Easy Fares and SISO. Um, so my first guest, and we've got uh, four this afternoon. Yeah, I think we're live. I can just see it. Just wanted to double check. Um, is a gentleman that I've worked with before at Closer Still Media, and he's uh, the consummate sales trainer. So I just want to introduce Paul Streeter to it. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. And you? I'm good. It's always good to see that I'm actually live because because I don't have an assistant. I, I always panic because I'm I'm I have my mobile in front of me and there's always a delay on the broadcast. <laughs> so okay. I've just well, seen that we are live and we've got a bunch of people already, so that's fantastic. Um Paul, nice to see you. We've known each other. And you too. Well. Thanks for the privilege of being here. It's, it's, it's a it's a joy to join you. Thank you. So um we've got four sessions today, of which you're the first, so no pressure. <laughs> always want to start well. Paul, we um as event exhibition professionals or you know whether it's exhibition or any sort of live event are really excited specifically in the uk but in other places where we aren't able to do that at the moment we're looking forward to a return to physical right um yeah. virtual's fantastic um and it ticks many boxes and it's brilliant um but you can't replicate a physical event online i think everyone accepts that so but i'm being a sales i guess professional myself and knowing people that are on now um it's definitely going to be a challenge to talk to potential exhibitors, both existing ones and new ones to sort of instill that confidence. So can you give us a sense today over the next sort of 40, 45 minutes? Um, and I should say guys, that if you have some questions, please ask them at Paul, drop them in uh, the comments section. I'll do my best to get to them towards the end. But Paul, if you can just give us a sense of what we're gonna talk about. Sure. Um, I want to talk about instilling confidence. And I think there are a number of, of ways in which or areas in which we have to do that. Firstly, I think we have to instill confidence in physical event safety. I think that's going to be an issue quite rightly for exhibitors. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk also about uh, instilling confidence in physical event value and ROI. Uh, and those of uh, you who know me will know that that's a, a key uh, obsession of mine in terms of talking about value. So I want to have a look at that. I also want to look at handling objections because quite rightly there will be some. You know, yeah. We can be as confident as we want to be, but at the same time people will say, well, hang on just a minute here. So we need to have a look at that. And I'd also like to finish up with the Q&A and, and action cool. planning and any other points around that. that that's fantastic. I'm sure it can be very useful. Um, first thing is, Paul, can we sort of go back to basics and um, – talk about the benefits and the value of the importance of face-to-face -face contact and the role of events. Can you sort of bring that to life? Sure. Um, and I, for me, one of the key things that, that we know about is the face-to-face -face impact uh, is absolutely crucial when we're in the sales environment. And what shows have done uh, in the past, up until you know, last year, is to say, you know, think of uh, this event as a, you know, 365 day year event with all the marketing around it, the in post show, but equally think of it as two, three, four days of face to face. And it's that face to face opportunity that is crucial. And I was uh, looking at your live cast from um, Aquatha, the, the Moscow, uh, yeah, the, uh, Moscow. In Moscow yesterday. And I watched it for two minutes because I think I came in at the, the, the back yeah. end of it. 
But the excitement of people that you were talking to in terms of just being face to face uh, and the opportunity that that presents in terms of not just the sales opportunity, but the fact that people have missed that. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, the kind of clamor I'm, I'm, I'm hearing and, and sensing around in terms of. And, and the AEO conducted a survey recently, and I'll, I'll quote from a couple of things here just because yeah. it's important. Uh, that survey found 87% of business directors agree it is easier to communicate face to face than phone or email, uh, which you would think is a given, but 87%, I love it. 80%, the second thing I found, 80% of directors agree that a person spends more money with people or companies they've met face to face. Now, my view on that is the comfort factor. If I'm going to spend money with anybody, I need to check them out. And if I can check out the individuals and buy them, people buy people first, that makes a difference. Um, I also noticed that the survey said 69% of attendees go on to recommend brands that they have encountered at events. Well, if anyone's going to be happy to recommend a brand uh, and it's mine on my behalf, then I'd be delighted with that. So we know the value of face to face and we shouldn't uh, forget how important it is. And I work on the basis that any company who's come this far in our current pandemic knows that this is a time to plan and deliver growth. Sure. And they will want to get face to face with people because that's an opportunity to demonstrate just what they can do, how good they are, why they're different from competitors and uh, make sure that they are having that face to face connection, which gives them the opportunity to uh, get what I call the relationship going. So yeah, we know the UK events industry is worth over 70 billion a year. It employs more than 600 professionals, but every single one of them will be working to ensure that, that events safely deliver face-to-face -face opportunities for exhibition organizers, for visitors and delegates. And I can't resist a Zig Ziglar quote because they're all around the place, but face-to-face -face conversations build relationships and they develop trust. And as, as Mr. Ziglar said, if they like you, they'll listen to you. Sure. If they trust you, they'll buy from you. And that's the thing that we've been missing. It's this ability to get face to face, check each other out and then build that trust. And then that's what a show, a physical event can bring. And we've missed it. And it's sure. time to get back. So I guess the takeaway from that is we need to sort of go. Um, and you might think, you know, your exhibitors, both existing and new, might know this already. But it's always, always worth uh, reinforcing the reasons why face to face is so important, right? It, because it's it, going to be a while, you know, by the t let's say an event doesn't happen until, I don't know, August, September, whenever. So it could have been 18 months since someone's exhibited physically. So it's sort of reinforcing some of the messages that you just mentioned and some of the statistics. Ab absolutely crucial. And I think one of the ways in which I want to pull an exhibitor into being comfortable to make a decision to exhibit at a physical event is to remind them of all the things it brings and that key one is face to face yeah because that cannot be replicated in other ways no i mean you've got that serendipitous moment of someone walking past your stand or you know having a drink with someone in a networking lounge or whatever it is which you can't replicate in a virtual capacity so um well, yeah that's crucial and that's actually interesting one of the things about people wanting to come back to the office and particularly sales professionals because they're missing that opportunity to bump into somebody they didn't know was going to be in today and have that conversation and that is also true of exhibitions and one of the things if i may um, is i know we'll go on to this later as well but you were highlighting the fact that a high percentage of people were saying look i'm uncertain about going booking a physical event it yeah. may not happen yeah. So the worst case scenario could be that um, the show doesn't actually happen on the date it was scheduled to do. Sure. And, and I want to actually have conversations with exhibitors and say, well, actually, Mr. Exhibitor, the, the, the worst case scenario is not that. The worst case scenario is that it does happen, but you decided not to go. Yeah. And you've missed, you've missed yeah. an opportunity to be face to face. Yeah. Uh, and I think we we want to gently but firmly challenge our exhibitors because I think they want to be there. They just need some persuasion, some encouragement uh, and some support. And we do those things as sales professionals on a continuous basis. Sure. So moving on to sort of event safety and obviously we're, we're not scientists, but um, this sort of 
all comes back into instilling confidence, right? And that's what we yeah. obviously try yeah. to do. I mean, people will make their own decisions about, you know, the amount of risk they're willing to take. Um, you mentioned here that obviously organisers are putting their credibility on the on the line, right? So they will follow all the guidelines that are laid down to them, you know, nationally, regionally. So can you, you sort of bring to life that if an exhibitor has concerns around safety, what we can do to sort of combat that objection? Yes. Um, and I think that we can combat that by actually illustrating what is the, the, our show and our event is actually um, doing to ensure that safety is paramount. And you're right to, to flag up the fact that, you know, reputation and credibility of an exhibition organiser is paramount and, and they want to have the best physical event they can. Now, all of them will say that they've previously run the best physical event, but they need to add this dimension of being safe uh, today. And uh, last week, another major events company published uh, its global health and safety strategy for events. Now, a number of companies have published these already. Uh, others will do so and probably being published as, as we speak. And, and that document is all about the protocols and processes that will give comfort and surety to exhibition sorry ex to exhibitors and to yeah. visitors and to delegates alike in terms of right this is what we're doing no one's taking any risks here that with your health what they're doing is to ensure that your business can continue to grow have those face-to-face -face conversations and this is how we're going to ensure that it's a safe environment and so i think the first thing i would say to an exhibitor is be absolutely certain that any exhibition organizer wants you to have a successful event. And that includes today, not just profitability and all the things that have come with it before, but safety. And they will be sharing that document and the way in which they intend to bring it to life. Sure, and hopefully in a few weeks, I mean, we've, we've already got safety protocols from test events, um, both in the UK yeah. and elsewhere. But the direction of travel will mean hopefully in a few weeks, couple of months, we will have that in a more formalized fashion that the whole industry is following. So very important for show organizers, uh, whether sales professionals, ops, marketing, to obviously convey that. And I think, again, that's building up confidence in the market, isn't it, with, with prospects? Yes, it is. And a number of show organizers, as you say, are also shoving this information back uh, to the government and the various uh, contacts that they've got there to ensure that, you know, physical events can be recognized uh differently from from the ones that they've decided yeah oh, they don't want to actually yeah. happen this will yeah. be absolutely crucial. so so yeah that that will happen and what i also want to do is that i've been looking back over the last year and this time last year even with the pandemic starting to to, to you know get a clear traction um Nobody thought twice about booking uh, a stand. Nobody thought twice about arranging a, a visitor pass. They were just going to go to events because that's what they've done. And my worry is that people have taken that out of their head now. So they're saying, all right, well, we don't do physical events. Uh, and that, that for me is, is the, the worst thing. So I think that what we have to do is to encourage them to say, well, the default is not I don't go to physical events anymore. Yeah. The default is that you do because you want face to face and net, but you have to go to those that are COVID safe, COVID secure, and uh, show organisers will demonstrate how they can do that. Yeah, I think the other thing is is communication. So it's all very well the industry, government coming up with these protocols, but personally, I think, and I'm sure we are, we need to be speaking to our exhibitors of all shapes and sizes, and asking them what will make them feel comfortable. Uh, and you'll pretty much find that that will match what we're doing anyway. So uh, I think, you know, in all sales, listening as much as, you know, is even more important than than telling and talking. Yeah, and I, I agree entirely there. One of the things for me is that I've always, when I've worked with sales professionals over, over the years, I've had the privilege of, of uh, working with many. And I've always said that, yeah, okay, you can call us sales professionals, all those kind of things you want to. But in fact, what we are is profit partners. We are in partnership with the exhibitor to ensure that they have a good event. If they have a good event, we have a good yeah. event. Yeah, if they have a good event, they rebook. Great, Debbie's talking about that later, I know. 
But for me, it's profit partner. Now, I've never recommended that anybody puts that on their business card. It's going to look a bit strange if you pass that over to the prospect. But the fact is that if we're in partnership with them, we can have those conversations at that level, which say, what is it that would concern you? And how can we ensure, how can I demonstrate to you that this is safe? Yeah. Uh, and what do you expect? What, what are you currently doing in your own organization to, to ensure that you're safe? Because I also need to... to encourage them to, if they choose not to go to physical events when it is entirely safe and proper and able to do so then they are going to miss a huge chunk of their marketing capacity and, yeah. and but but that alone won't drive them there what they need to be able to do is to recognize uh, what show organizers are doing and of course it may be that we need to say to them yeah look let me know and i will join in a conversation with two or three of your you know board in order to ensure that everyone is as satisfied as they can be sure and i'm sure we're going to do more around that area if that's what's appropriate as we move through the early part of 2021 then fine it'll work yeah and i think you're right i mean the partnership element again in all of this is really key it always has been rather than trying to sell someone a solution and then you know them thinking well that's all, all you want from me and moving on yeah that ever more is going to come. That's got to come to the fore. I've just got to um, Matthew Harris. I'm just going to put this comment that he's just put up on screen, and yeah. it's interesting because he's saying this is what an exhibitor has suggested they want. Okay, well, yeah. possibly that's fine. And that, so when I come back to communicating, that needs to be taken back to you know senior management organisers um, as a as a specific measure that maybe people want if they're hearing that thing. Uh, from from exhibitors, I, I I think that's tremendous. I mean, that the, the, there won't be your your typical touch screens kicking around everywhere. Uh, all of this will be digitally passed around. That's absolutely fine, but it won't prevent the face to face discussion. Sure. Um, I know in the early days of this, and actually, you know, uh, six months ago, we would see pe signs of people who've met somebody and accidentally shook hands. Yeah, and then realise that this wasn't something they should do. Um, and I think that that's a recognition that, that people want and that's how they behave and that's what they want to do. But, yeah, I'm sure that it, we will probably be walking around events, uh, social distancing for, for a while. We may have masks on, as you showed from Aquatherm yesterday. Fine. Yeah. All of those things will ensure that we don't then take a physical card out. But that doesn't yeah. stop the card being passed digitally. Uh, and yeah. good. That, that's what we can do. So moving on to um, event value and return on investment, and obviously you mentioned this earlier, understanding the prospects' needs and requirements. Uh, talk to talk to me about that at this at this point in time, uh, in terms of you know instilling confidence, getting back to physical. Well, the the point about event value for me is that um, this is our job as sales professionals to ensure that we underpin. Uh, exactly what's in it for the, our prospect, our exhibitor. Uh, and it is easy to do that, but it's, sorry, let me put it this way. It's not difficult to do that. That's our job. But it's easy to forget to do that because we know the show inside out and we forget that somebody might not. Uh, and also we don't use the, the right language. So you know, I, I will talk to people um uh, about visitors uh, and suddenly realize I shouldn't be talking about visitors. You know, you there are going to be over 10,000 visitors. There's no value in talking to somebody, uh, an exhibitor about 10,000 visitors. What I want to do is to say to them, look, there are just over 10,000 targeted customers of yours. Some of them are new. Many of them are existing. A few of them may be lapsed and you want to have conversations with every one of them. How important yeah. is it to you that you're able to have those face to face conversations? And that's what I mean by the language in terms of how we discuss that, because if we just go through the, yeah, we've got 10,000 visitors. Yeah, we got this. We got this. We got this. Uh, the other point about that is, is, you know, I still hear people saying, well, how many square meters do you want? Yeah. Well, if you and I, Dan, have been working together for, for 10 years we may well find we've got a short on how many square meters sure but if i haven't worked with you before that would be death wouldn't it i mean i would actually change what is a consultative sales process instantly into um a transactional process where cost and money would be the only order of the day and you don't really want um square meters and your average individual 
uh, exhibitor doesn't actually know how many square meters they want anyway. So why should we ask them? So what I want to do is change our language and start saying to our exhibitor, what are you going to do at the show? If I walk through the show and I come off aisle two and there in front of me is your stand, what would you want me as a potential customer to see? How are you going to present that? That your organization's brand, reputation, credibility is crucial. You started driving that from some banners you've got in the registration area. What do you want people to see? And how many people are going to be on your stand? What kind of discussions are you going to have? You may not be able to do the kind of things that we've enjoyed doing, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of um, uh, demonstrations, but you may be doing something. You may have an area where you want to have secure conversations. How are you going to structure all of that? Now, if you tell me those things, Dad, I'm going to summarize all of that because I want to remind you of what's exciting and get your imagination working. And then I'm going to say, based on that, I think you need somewhere between 20, 25 square meters. Sure. And that's the deal. That It's that you're not buying the square meters. You don't want some contaminated carpet tiles for, for a square. You want the, the opportunity to have face-to-face -face conversations, generate quality sales leads, and convert those into revenue. And in order to do that, you need a presence at the event. I want to find out how you can do that. So that's what I mean by language. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And I think also um, in, terms of ter in terms of return on investment, we as, as sales professionals can't understand that unless we ask the questions around, for example, average order value, lifetime value of a customer, um, the, 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 the products or services they're going to be promoting at the show. Maybe that's going to be different to what they do normally um so you know how much a new how much a customer spends with you in year one well so, absolutely yeah. right and this this is fascinating for me because i am absolutely convinced that that if i'm going to buy somebody if you're going to buy somebody one of the ways in which we buy them is to secure evidence and and some of that evidence is the quality of the questions they're asking us and i picked the phone up as to you from people who are <coughs> attempting to sell me something um, the one this morning who rang, unfortunately, was trying to refer me to an event when I had some um, lagging fitted in the in the loft, which is strange because a I haven't b I haven't got a loft. But the fact is that, that you know, you, if if someone's asking you a question, you'll make a judgment on that and say that's a good question. Yeah. Or oh, here we go. It's question number two in a list of ten. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we can actually get those questions. Uh, right because they give us the opportunity to explore things then equally we also uh, are saying to somebody this is exactly how uh, you should begin to trust us and i would say to somebody well how would you follow up your sales leads i want to know how they're going to follow up the sales leads how many sales leads are you expecting to get what does a high quality sales force acceptable sales lead look like to your team yeah. Uh, and how are you going to secure them? What's the time frame in you securing them at, at the show and then following them up? I mean, I'm guessing, Mr. Prospect, that, that anything you get on day one, you, by day two of the event, you have actually contacted those people. And I sometimes when I'm talking to a, a prospect, they say, yeah, of course we do that. But others go, well, that's a good point. I should do that. Yeah, and, and, I mean, it's always amazes me. Like um, you basically <coughs> point, it amazes me that when I speak to a prospect after a show, they necessarily haven't followed it up. And I think establishing the benchmark of success beforehand is critical. Yes, it so, is. You know, I think I'm spending X amount of pounds. I want a hundred leads. Okay, what's that based on? Uh, but if you got fifty, and the average spend was this, would that be enough? Um, as you said, how are you going to um, prospect them afterwards? So it all comes back to that collaboration, doesn't it? And partnership and also how we can help them. It's not about selling them a stand or a sponsorship or stuff. It's about it, working with them. Yeah, It absolutely is not because, and this for me, there's a, there's a kind of personal pride here and an ownership thing, which is that if anyone is going to use my show, then I want them to use it well. Yeah. Um, that's not a conversation I need to have with a prospect. But the reality is that what I want to do is to say to the prospect, you know, yes, how are you going to actually have a conversation with somebody? Um, and how are you going to convert those leads? And what is your average conversion rate? 
Um, and as you said, what's the spend in year one? And it doesn't take long for them to actually get ahead of you. So I see where you're going with this. Well, yeah, actually, that's where I'm going on the basis that this is the opportunity that a physical event, face-to-face -face opportunities give yeah. you. Uh, and you need to change those that, that that vocabulary up so that you are having the conversation and asking the questions. And, and the other thing I wanted to, to flag at this point um, is that I don't think there's any such thing as, as you know, um, post-sales or after-sales activity. Everything we do when we're talking to um, exhibitors as show organizers, everything we do is about sales. We are having a sales conversation every time we pick the phone up or meet them or email them or send them a proposal. Uh, and every time we do that, we need to take the opportunity to remind them of a benefit, of a value, because that's what keeps the momentum going. Uh, yeah. And if we can do that, then not only will we have secured their commitment seven, eight months, nine months out, but we will keep it as we continue to. And I know you know, I know some salespeople say, well, I've got them in. That's not, we don't need to talk to them again until just before the yeah. show. Well, I'm not sure that's, that's true. Well, um, I think also at the moment, uh, clearly with so many shows uh, in, a, in a short period of time, back end of the year or 2022, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for exhibitors to think about where they place their money. So, yes. you know, we're going to have to stand out as salespeople ever more and put forward the, the value proposition of our event compared to someone else's because it's now almost a level playing field again. Every 18 months, two years, people would have stepped back, thought about what's worked, what they want to do going forward. So we're almost starting a game with a lot of people. Well, that is absolutely true. And let, let's look at that, you know, 18 months, two years. The reality is that a lot of people that, that um, we may have known, or the rather our, our potential exhibitor may have known, actually doesn't anymore because they moved out of the sector. That as well, uh, yeah, good point. People yeah. have moved in and yeah. it's crucial that we get in front of them. Uh, and make absolutely sure that, that we can remind them of, of what we do. So from, a, from an exhibitor point of view, yeah, you're right. They, they actually need to be thinking about this. Yeah. Um, value make, is absolutely... Sorry, I was going to say, you make a good point. Unfortunately, people either would have lost their jobs in, 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 in an exhibitor firm or they might have moved on. So, you know, we can't rest on our laurels with lapsed clients. Um, we need to make sure that we've also got the right contact and they understand the um, the show again. Yeah, I get I get that. Um, objections. Sorry, did you want to say something else on that point? Yeah, I was just um, going to to flag one thing. If if I were making any recommendation today uh, to me as a sales professional about to talk to um, exhibitors about returning to physical events, it would be that I must redesign my sales story. Okay my show as to why it is it should be the the, the choice for uh, a physical event for that person you talk about budget if they've only got one show to go to uh, uh it should be mine and and i think redesigning the sales story is something that every one of us as sales professionals would find a valuable thing to do and driving that redesign should be the what's the one thing that my event can deliver for an exhibitor mm. that either no other event can or can't do as well yeah and, and that's what we've got to lead with we've got to be able to say if, if i was selling to you dan i would say thank you very much indeed dan let's confirm exactly what it is you're looking for yeah. now the first thing i want to tell you is this is what my event can do for you and you will not find any other event that will do it to that standard stroke quality stroke whatever yeah. it is and, and also on the, flip, on the flip side it's a good opportunity to then you know, we've all come across customers that we just can't get from a competitor event. And now it's probably a really good time because they haven't had access to that event for so long. Yep. Um, and there's an opportunity to, you know, again, level playing field, reinforce why they should come to your event uh, rather than previous. Absolutely right. Correct. OK, so I want to move on to some um, uh, objections. Now, I did a quick poll. Uh, on this page, uh, and no shock, 86% of people said the main objection they're getting is, well, you might have the best show in the world, and I believe everything you say about it, but is it going to take place? Um, even though people will have COVID clauses of refunds and moving and all this sort of stuff, it's still going to be a challenge. 
especially now when the sector hasn't got an opening date um to convince people to at least even interact with you um give us some give us your view on how how people can start to overcome those sort of objections well you're absolutely right i mean somebody's going to say uh, exactly that you know i'm, I'm not sure this is going to take place uh, if i'm not sure any physical events going to take place so i'm i'm not going and, and you know my approach on objections is to acknowledge them and recognize them they are perfectly valid comments for anybody to make but i want to understand why they're making them so i yeah. say well you know if the show does take place would you want to be there firstly yep. yeah um, and what is it that makes you think it doesn't take place and what is it that worries you about the fact that it, it might not take place because if it doesn't take place then you know that there will be proper restructuring and everything yep. else so there's no risk at that level um and one would argue that if it doesn't take place, it's because it couldn't, and therefore it will be restructured to a point when it can take place, and you still want to be part of it. Yeah. So I'm not sure there's a, there's a risk in this. If you want to go to the event because it's got your customers there that you need to have face-to-face -face conversations with, if it turns out the show can't take place, then in a sense, you're already part of that event. So you get to be... Um, the, the, the process of continuing the marketing of that event while it's moved to a, a place where it can take place uh, yeah. is going to ensure that you're still part of it. it for me, it's, it's not being part of it. It's the risk. Uh, and as I said, it wasn't meant to be a joke. You know, <laughs> if, if you said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to book because I think it might get moved, but supposing it didn't get moved and you looked at it and you knew that there's no value in looking from the outside in and saying, well, my competitors are actually there. You know, and and yeah. they did look and they, they risked it. So is there a risk? Yeah, there's a risk it might not take place. Uh, and neither you nor I and anybody else can sit here and say that, that that's not a risk. Of course it's a risk. Um, that said, I suspect there's also more risk in going around a supermarket today, which we're allowed to do, than going to a physical event, but don't get me on that one. Uh, <laughs> but I would actually say that it, the risk is not that it won't take place. The risk is that when it does, you are not part of it. So it's the, it's, it's the old fear of missing out to a certain extent, right? Which well, you know, we, works every yeah. single time. Yeah. Um, yeah, big, you, know, and, you and I have had this conversation before, and I've said you, know, you there are three there are three main players in this marketplace mr prospect you're one of them if you choose not to exhibit at the event your competitors will be there what's happened is that you've now reduced the customer's choice that you don't yet know from three to two sure and the other thing is that if they choose if they don't choose you but they're making a purchase that they would expect to to uh operate effectively within their organization for two to three to four years well, that means it could be two to three to four years before you get a chance to repitch to that particular individual. And so for, for me, the, the, the issue is be there, be present. If the show doesn't happen on the date it was going to, but needs to get moved, well, we've all moved, haven't we? Including yeah. the visitors and the customers. So therefore, but I'm still part of it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a crucial thing. Yeah, and also using third-party endorsement through the customers that you've already got on board, um, delegates potentially that have signed up, any other feedback that you've got to, you know, so it's not just you telling them, it's other people telling them that they re that they know and respect. Um, I think also in terms of budget, now, you know, we can, we can do a three-hour session on budget handling. We could. But around this time, so, you know, I've put my budget into virtual or actually it's been cut. Um, well, I don't know what it is at the moment because never mind whether you know if you're going to do a show. This is very sector dependent. I get it because some sectors are still booming like tech, so you'd still expect them to have lots of budgets. Yeah. Um, do you think handling that objection now is different, or would you would you still use tried and tested methods? And if so, what would you suggest? I, I'm a, always suspicious of the budget uh, objection because it tends to be the catch-all that picks everything else up. Sure. Uh, and that's why with good questioning, I want to tease it out earlier on. So one of my questions during the, the uh, discovery process um, would be, you know, Mr. Prospect, you've talked to me about your marketing. It includes uh, events and physical events because they're re happening again. That's just wonderful. But do you yeah. mind telling me how will your marketing be funded? And I'm, I'm trying to lift the budget discussion away from the, oh, yeah, budget into a, a, a business conversation about funding and, and the recognition that, 
yeah, of course you're going to have some money behind it. Uh, but if you're saying to me that you don't have the budget, uh, then I'd like to know that sooner rather than later, if that makes sense. So yeah. what I don't want to do in a sales conversation is be blindsided by somebody saying to me three quarters of the way through, oh, by the way, I've got no budget. I should have teased that out earlier on. Now, if somebody says to me, we don't actually have the budget, the other thing I'm going to do is to say, thanks for letting me know. You're telling me that because it may well raise up later on. But uh, how is your organization securing budget at the moment? Because I know lots of companies that have no budget whatsoever for marketing, but it can be secured on a case-by-case -case basis sure. at when a proposal is made. And if you'd like me to contribute to your proposal for releasing part of the budget for this particular event, because you think it's worthwhile doing, I'd be delighted to do that. So should we have a look at the event and what's possible? And then we can come back and see how we can help you secure from the finance department the monies. Sure. So but, but budget is, is, I like talking about budget. Sometimes people say, well, I haven't got any. But yeah, don't forget, I, I may well have been on the phone to them for 20 minutes and then they tell me yeah. I haven't got any budget. Well, what, why? What, what, what is it that's happened? You know, yeah. you obviously are interested by this event. So I'm, I'm happy to have a budget discussion. Um, there are some who will say, you know, Paul, you're absolutely right, but I'm going to have to place it elsewhere. I can't do this, I can't do this. Uh, uh, and they say no, but they only say no for the duration of this call. And I'm going to say, well, Mr. Prospect, let's put a call in because yeah. I wouldn't be doing my job properly and your sales force do exactly the same thing. They put a call in even when it looks like they're unable to be doing any work at the moment with a particular prospect. Let me talk to you about this, this, this and this and this. And then I'm going to continue throwing them stuff because sure. they are going to see that, in fact, if it's about allocating budget, then there's a very good reason for moving whatever they have allocated to the event that I represent. Yeah, and I think also it's about finding the right people. So what I found, it's not just about, and I know we're talking generally here, so it's not about COVID or physical or whatever, return to physical, but it's getting other stakeholders in board. So, you know, if I was selling to a tech company, it wouldn't just be their marketing and event person I'll speak to. I'll actually speak to their salesperson. What does a salesperson want to do? Similar to me, they want to generate leads. Yeah. So if you can commit, and they might have been starved of leads at the moment because they weren't going to physical events. Um, so if I'm speaking to a sales director or a company, yes, he hasn't got the final decision, but if he buys into my event, so many occasions, I'm sure other people that are listening will tell you that where the marketing and event manager said there's no budget, once the sales director got involved, all of a sudden they found budget because they're there to generate leads. This is absolutely crucial, and I agree with you entirely. And sometimes you and I have had to generally remind marketeers that actually their primary role is to generate leads. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I work on the basis that, that the marketeer is there to generate leads. Uh, the sales director, the, so that's the marketing director. The, the sales director is there to um, generate revenue. Uh, and the board CEO is there to generate profit. And they can't generate that profit unless revenue comes in. And as you said, the sales director can't get the revenue unless the leads up. So yeah. the most important role here is probably going to be the marketeer. And you know, I'm very happy to say to the marketing manager, yeah, I know that you'll be judged on the number and quality of the leads that you generate uh, at any given point during a, a trading year. So how can I help you with my event achieve that? Sure. Now, that's pushing it a bit, isn't it? But at the same time, yeah. I think we have the right through partnership discussions because, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, to work with them. We, if we can help them be successful, we're successful. Uh, and yeah. the other thing, of course, is to say to somebody, you know, I understand that, that you know, that there's a responsibility for funding here. Uh, can you tell me, is that something that you share in concert with other people? Is it, is it a board decision, a, co a collective yeah. decision, or is it a solo capacity? And is there somebody else that you'd like me to talk to? Uh, yeah. You're right, like that marketing, sales, yeah. and the CEO yeah. thing works. Yeah, because traditionally, depending on the sector, especially if you're talking about an event where they're spending 10, 20, 30,000, it's not one person's decision, right? So oh. there's, there's many ways to get influence um, within an organization. I um, want to move on to the sort of final part. And then uh, just to say, guys, if you have any questions for Paul, uh, I know I've got some comments, which is great. If you have any specific questions regarding any of the topics we've discussed, please put them in the chat now and then we can get to them in a few minutes time. Um, 
so the final the part of this paul you mentioned uh throughout this actually rewriting the sales story yeah so it sort of comes into action planning yeah um so i'm not saying we're going to do this as organizers we we do refresh our material every year fine it might be a new logo different packages but this time around it's really important actually that we reframe the conversation especially also because we've got virtual support we can give them in between the shows so can you bring that to life a bit yes of course i can and and i think you're right that there's going to be some uh investment in in restructuring that that's absolutely fine but but the investment required is a mental one for, from the sales professional's point of view because if i um when i'm able to and i'm really looking forward to getting back to physical events myself um when i'm able to walk into a, a room full of sales professionals one of the things i like to do is to look at one of the individuals there and say what's the one thing about the event that you're selling that is better than any other event in its class today and i expect that question to be answered i expect that person to say i'll tell you thank you for asking xyz event does do, 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 do better than anybody else because 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 and the value comes out and then the excitement yeah. comes out sometimes i get that more often than not i might get uh and you think no that's not what i want i want you to actually share so i i need to uh, remind sales professionals that that every you know, um opportunity to deliver the unique sales point or whatever they want to call it for for me is crucial uh, and if they've got a sales story they they are the guardians of that sales story um it it needs mental power it needs practice it's the kind of thing that you should do when you're kicking around so we're just saying how am i going to phrase this but for me rewriting that sales story so that you can say to a prospect thank you so much mr prospect for outlining that i understand exactly what you want let me illustrate now what XYZ event can do to ensure that you deliver on all the goals that you've got there. The first thing I will tell you is that my event does. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, absolutely right. And I think also to create that urgency at a time where possibly there isn't an urgency yet because of the situation we're in, the last 12 months as organizers, we've created a whole host of other hooks, digitally, virtually, you know, all different bits yeah. and pieces. So it's also, making sure now that people understand that this is an annual process with exhibitors i personally think gone are the days where you just attend a show you don't speak to them again and then you phone them up about rebook a few months before or whenever um we're building campaigns for organizations yeah. so if they were to commit now to a campaign a lead up to a show which includes the physical show even if the physical show got postponed they've still had value beforehand yes so there's a way around from a contractual perspective to deliver it. So personally, I'd always be saying, right, if you start now, yep, you've got the show. I can do this in March, this in April, this in May, so on and so forth. The show's in September. If you come to June, the show's postponed. You've got that comfort of the clause, but you've already, we can generate leads for you um, in many innovative ways that we weren't doing before. Absolutely right. And and the, the generating of leads starts as soon as you're able to send me a DocuSign yeah contract back please because that's what you actually want here uh, and yeah. I, I agree the the um that it's the constant the process and that urgency is is crucial that isn't difficult to do as you've just reminded it uh, me on the basis that well there are, there are lots of things happening here in terms of campaigns supporting the event yeah uh, and, and you know when somebody says to me oh yeah but it's, it's eight months away we, need, we don't need to make a decision right now well let me remind you of how that eight months is going to disappear Mm -hmm. let me remind you secondly about all the things that are going to happen in the eight months and let me remind you that the you know the the generating of sales leads which is a crucial requirement for you for you happens as soon as you send that document back and we get underway sure sure yeah. i think that's really important i think um so thank you for that charlotte i'm going to put this i guess statement um back on on sorry on the screen the argument around quality versus quantity may be a valid point when getting exhibitors back. I think that's really important. I think marketing teams, show uh, content teams are going to be working harder and harder to make sure that we get the right people in the room and matching them with the exhibitors and what they want. So that can only be a benefit. So when can I add a point to that? Is, yeah. is that um, and thanks, Charlotte. Um, for, for me, one of the things that, that I always find fascinating is, is, to, is to indicate, you know, that who do you want to see? Who are the people, Mr. 
Mr. Exhibitor, that, that you actually want to have a conversation with. Um, and then to illustrate the amount of energy, effort, and investment that goes into getting the right audience for them. Sure. Because I'm not sure that a lot of exhibitors know that. And so they go for the quantity thing, as Charlotte's indicated, uh, and sometimes we miss a point to remind them that quantity is important, but actually what it really matters is you're having a conversation with somebody who has the authority to say, yes, please, I want this mm -hmm. contract. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I know that a number of uh, organizations that I uh, have the privilege of working with in terms of their salespeople uh, invest uh, uh, significant sums in getting an individual to attend as a delegate, as a visitor. Uh, and I think we need to find a way in our sales story of reinforcing that quality because that stops our exhibitor comparing, contrasting our event with someone where there's a quantity of visitors, but not the quality. Sure. Uh, and that's another pull through. Oh. No, absolutely. Charlotte makes another good point here, which is getting those bellwether clients to come on board first. OK, hopefully if shows, shows have been rolled over, you've already got them on board and using them as your authority and your sort of yardstick for other customers that maybe haven't come into the show. Yeah. Um, I think you'd agree that's an important point, right? So we get others on the show yeah. for us. Yeah, absolutely crucial. If, if we're able to say, look, these are the people we have already, then, then strangely enough, there's a security around that, isn't there? Sure. Uh, and if they've made a decision to be there, um then uh, then clearly i have a security of making a decision to, to be there as well so yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the things that, that you look at from the look i've got my sales story now what's the sequence in terms of who i need to actually have a conversation with because if i can get the right people in i can use that information to say this is who's coming i can yeah. send that information out i can actually flag up already signed up to exhibit at such and such and use that as part of my sales story I'd also want to uh, check my discovery process and restructure my questions because I think there are questions that we might be asking now that we wouldn't have dreamed of asking 18 months ago. Sure. Uh, and we need to make sure we've got a polished way of asking those. Uh, I want to use the right language, but then we've had that conversation. Most of all, however, what I really want to be is realistically upbeat and confident. Um, I was once thrown out of a hotel breakfast room at seven o'clock in the morning for being. Where are we going with this? Where are we going with this story? <laughs> for being too upbeat and confident. I was welcoming the group I was working with that day, and some of whom stayed overnight. Uh, and uh, there was a gentle chorus of, uh, look, it's too bloody early in the morning, Paul, to be this positive and upbeat. So I decided to have breakfast somewhere else. But I, I will never apologize for being upbeat and positive because I think it's contagious. Uh, and if we can support that positivity and that belief that this will happen, and that physical events are tremendous in terms of face-to-face, -face, then what we can do is to back that up with all the discussion that we've just had over the past few minutes. Uh, and if, as I remain convinced, people buy people first, not only will they buy the Bellwether clients, but they'll also buy you as the person that, that's convincing them. And they may even say, Dan, I'm with you, uh, my colleague's with you, but our chairman needs to be convinced. Can I hook you in on a call to him, her, whatever? Yes, sure. of course you can. Sure. Uh, and I suspect we may have more of those situations coming up, and I would welcome them because it means that we're making a difference here and getting people. Paul, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you, Dan. It's been a privilege to join your session this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, any other questions that are there, I'll happily take them. Yeah, we but we well people could still ask questions on the um on the chat and if um, any others come up i can i can we can coordinate on the group Do that. Um, we so we're gonna take a quick uh, break paul just for those that if they want to contact you what's the best way for them to do that well uh paul streeter training services is the website so www paulstreetertrainingservices.co.uk. That'll get to my website. Equally, I'm on LinkedIn, which is probably the easiest way of finding me. Uh, and you can do that from all the links that you've been posting cool. out. Uh, cool. So, and I would be delighted to have a conversation with anybody, either to follow up something specific in this or just generally to catch up. Uh, and can I thank on 
via you, Dan, all the people that have tuned in this afternoon to listen to this. I hope yeah. it's been informative uh, and I hope it's actually made a difference. It's probably told them all the things that they knew, but I hope it's made many of them go, oh, yes, that's a good point. Yeah. No, I'm, sure. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. We, we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, look forward to yeah. it too. Take care, Bye. Dan. So, guys, that's uh, Paul Streeter. Thank you so much. We've got three more sessions coming up after a quick break. The next session will start at two o'clock. And it's an interesting session. I've got two exhibitors and also um, a show organiser from a membership organisation who are going to talk about um, their experience of virtual events, how they want to return to physical, how you should approach them, so on and so forth. So, um if you can come back at two o'clock or about one minute to two um and then at three o'clock we have Stephen Murta, the exhibition guy and at four o'clock uh debbie lee from um benchmark collective and if you check uh, my posts within this group you can see exactly what they're going to be speaking about so but we've got some great um discussions coming up so look forward to joining you at two o'clock <laughs>